the sheer magnitude of the NSA's surveillance system is mind-boggling. The level of intrusion into our lives is difficult to grasp. How can we make sense of it all? And how can we judge it? To find answers to these questions, we've traveled to Berlin. Our aim? To look at a much older spying apparatus, that of the Stasi in former East Germany. The Stasi had a reputation as one of the most notorious and yet efficient surveillance systems in the world. And by going to the former Stasi headquarters, we hope to get a better sense of how surveillance used to work in previous times, when technology was not digital but analog, and when most of the data collection and analysis was done by humans rather than computers. This then helps us to compare and contrast how the Stasi operated back in those days with what the NSA and its global partners are doing today. So today, 26 years after the end of East Germany in 2016, we're still looking at 111 kilometers of, of shelves filled with documents from the Stasi. On top of that, we have 1.7 million uncontextualized photographs. We have over 25,000 audio files and videos um, that, that they left behind as sort of their legacy of, of documented human rights violations, you might say, that we can, that we can look at today. That seems like a huge number and it is a huge, huge archive that is till today complicated to access because the Stasi didn't store the information for us to find it. Never ever in their worst nightmares could they, could they envision that there was a time where practically anybody could access their precious information. So, but within this organization, you can study the mechanisms of keeping something secret because they coded information and they hid it and they compartmentalized it. So not even within the Stasi, everybody had access to everything that was around. We have um, a system of index cards. We have 41 million index cards in about 4,000 different subsystems, which was sort of the codifier of information for the Stasi. Index cards um, ha have registry numbers that lead to other index cards that lead to archive numbers. So you couldn't easily come up with a, with, the, with a record on you or me. You had to go through a complicated system of information retrieval that was all analog, but it, it shows you how they were thinking and how they would store information and how important it was to them to keep things secret and never leak anything outside. So the mentality of secrecy can be studied as well in the archive. So we want to understand more about the Stasi, so I would like to ask you to give us a sense of who the Stasi was and perhaps to briefly run us through the Stasi's history. Well, the Stasi is a colloquial term for what is called fully the Ministry for State Security. So it was a militarily organized ministry in East Germany. It existed from 1950 through 1989, which is pretty much the time of existence of East Germany. And uh, we call it a secret police as a ministry because it was there to guard the power of the Socialist Party of East Germany. For the 40 years of East German existence, it was a one-party monopoly, so to speak. It was a Socialist Party who ran the country and it wanted to make sure that its rule would not be broken. So the Ministry for State Security was tasked with, with protecting the power of the party. It considered itself, even in its own parlance, as the shield and sword of the party. It gathered a huge amount of information on its own citizens. It had a smaller branch for foreign espionage, but its main job was to keep the, the own population in line and never question the rule of the party. So how then did the Stasi surveillance and spying system actually work? How many people were involved? How did it operate? So we look at a period of 40 years, so there is an evolution and a change of, of, of system in it. But then you start out thinking that your people at any given time and place could rise up against you and that would be worst case scenario. You have a huge amount of, of, of uh, paranoia and, and worry about that your own people could go against you. 
In the beginning, in the early 1950s, the Stasi had a very moderate system set up for reporting. They were very much aligned with the party. The Soviets were around a lot to guide them along. But in 1953, in June 17, the people rose up against the government. Over a million people were demonstrating on the streets and they wanted the Communist Party rule to end. And that was a huge shock to the system. So from that moment on, the Stasi was reprimanded by the party and the party said, you should have told us that the people are so angry at us that they would rise up. This is sort of our, our, our ground zero. This is horrible. This can never happen again. So from then on, the Stasi very much intensified its effort to understand what the people were thinking. And how do you do that? you install informants throughout society. The Stasi had a really big system of, of information gathering through what today would be called human intelligence. In their, in their wording, it was called unofficial collaboration. So it's a, it's a bureaucratic term, but I'm using it because that's how in our documents you will find it. It's in German abbreviated an IM, an inoffizieller Mitarbeiter or an unofficial, unofficial collaborator. So at the very end, by 1989, there were about 180,000 unofficial collaborators in a Germany of around 17 million people. And on top of that, the ministry itself had about 91,000 official staffers. So you're looking at around 270,000 people officially and unofficially working for the Stasi and delivering information. And on top of that, you had over 2 million party members who to a certain degree were also delivering information. So you have this huge reporting and information system that the Stasi was gathering um, and storing in its archives to at any moment understand where somebody might be critical or against the system and they could start acting. But of course this is the analog age, right? And that's probably why it is human intelligence upon which the analog age relied on when it comes to spying and surveillance. Well, the, the Stasi had, you know, first of all, a lot of people that gave them information. To a smaller degree, they could use technology. Of course, they could tap phones. And in, in a very severe case, they would actually bug an apartment. And they would put a person under 24-7 surveillance. But the information that they would get from unofficial collaborators was often sufficient to really build a good case against enemy thought in that person. And then there was this regular reporting system that they would store information in from teachers, from the heads of factories, from um, cultural um, groupings that would, or cultural theater directors that would deliver just regular information and sometimes unofficial information to them, the police. I mean, they, they were everywhere in society and it was to the majority or on the surface to the majority, an important tool to make sure that socialism would, socialism would prevail. But technology wasn't really a big factor. The Stasi did start working with computers already in the late 60s and build up a system of, of statistics and putting date, data entry. But it, it was really very minimal and because they were embargoed, they didn't have access to technology. It, it was only always in the beginning stages, you know, so there isn't that much technology involved. And the access to, to telephones for East German citizens wasn't really all that great. So in the late 80s, the maximum amount of phone numbers phone lines the Stasi could bug and listen into with around 4,000 in the area of Berlin, which doesn't seem that big. But it's enough to put thousands of people in jail. You know, that's what the, what the end result often was.